Hello again, everyone. Welcome to our second video lecture on virtual memory. So what we did last time was we talked about an overview of memory management, talking about virtual address space and physical address space, and the division of each into small equal size blocks called pages. So we were also talking about mapping these pages from the virtual address space to the physical address space, and that is address translation. And so a key piece of hardware that, that will assist in doing that is the trans translation look-aside buffer. And we'll continue with that now. So as we were mentioning last time, the TLB has to be, an ex has to be extremely fast. It's because we're, we're making uh, address translations on every machine instruction. So certainly for the program counter, but often for the data as well. And so to achieve this kind of speed, most TLBs are fully associative, as you talked about in when talking about caches. So there's an example. It's, it's just one set, a single set, with all the page table entries in place there. And <clears throat> so, again, speed is achieved by a simultaneous hardware, uh, hardware lookup of all all entries in in the TLB. Okay, now the the size of this thing is generally very relatively small, varies between processor types, but is in general is always much smaller than the page table for each process. So there's a tiny subset of of entries in the TLB. So a typical TLB holds uh, 64 translations. So sometimes more, sometimes less. And so let's now check out what happens on TLB hits and misses. <clears throat> okay, starting with a hit. Okay, so this is this is good. So a translation needed for, for a particular instruction is there. It's in the TLB. And so we can snatch it out right away. And, and proceed with the with address translation. Okay, now if we have a miss, now for whatever reason, the translation might not be in the TLB. And we'll talk about different kinds of misses here in a sec. So anyway, a needed translation is not in the TLB. So some action is gonna to have to be taken and the operating system is going to assist us because a an exception is produced automatically on a, on a TLB miss. So the processor, the uh, operating system kernel then is brought in to intervene. Okay, a little bit more now on TLB misses. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so in comparing the TLB to caches, these are handled a little bit differently. For example, the, the uh, cache misses are handled by hardware, so so card cache hardware, self so cache circuits, and meanwhile the TLB, depending on on the processor type that were being used, its processor design, the TLB might use some combination of hardware and um, and and, the, and software in the form of intervention by the operating system. All right, now let's focus on, on handling uh, TLB misses. So, and in particular, the kinds of misses, because we'll have a different action for each kind. So for this, we refer you to a, the document TLB organization on the course website. So please have a look at this. We'll be referring to it a little bit later as well. And so, uh, first, if the page is in memory and not just in the TLB, well, this is a fairly easy fix. So it's handled very quickly by the operating system after the exception has been called. Um, so the, up, the TLB is updated with the appropriate entry in the page table. So the page table entry. Second kind, this is more serious. Page is on the disk, so it's not in memory at all. And so handling this takes a long time. 
so what is involved is, you know, if we want to access this page and access this page, we've got to bring it into memory first. So we've got to read it in from the disk. And we call this a page fault. And finally, the third one is if the page table is not valid at all. So in that case, the operating system typically just terminates the program and, and might give you a message. Segmentation violation or uh, operation not permitted, something like that. So a little bit more about item number two. So this is on page faults. So uh, as mentioned, it can be very expensive and disk access compared to the uh, processors uh, itself can take millions of processor cycles. But at least it allows us to put pages on the disk. And so uh, we can have systems using more memory than we have physically installed. However, because of we may be copying pages back and forth like this, to and from memory in the disk, it can be very time consuming. And so if we have a memory intensive program running, and perhaps with a lot of other system activity, it will run very slowly, and especially if memory is limited. But at least we can run them, so the program will run without the system rejecting the program outright for not having enough memory to accommodate it. Okay, now remember that we've got just a single processor core, and, and so we're also allowing a multitasking operating system, which means we can have multiple processes running. So as we showed in, in the overview diagram in the last video lecture. So the question is, how, how does the operating system manage multiple processors if all we got is a single processor core? So let's talk about a pair of processors, process number one and number two. So a process switch, which is also called a context switch. So this, this can be caused by several different kinds of events. So here are some of them. So, in the absence of any other system activity, a timer interrupt can be generated uh, automatically. And so this, gen this creates a hardware exception, and it tells the kernel that process number one has used up its time slice, and it's time to share the processor with another process. So a time slice is, is typically short, so uh, in the order of 10 milliseconds or so. And, and so that gives the appearance of, of the processor, you know, sharing this, the, pro, the uh, sharing it, the resources equally among these processors. So a second thing they could do is a system call, such as, you know, we get writing or reading from, from an external device, uh, from process number one, or if we have a page fault in process number one. Since that takes lots and lots of processor cycles, let's put something else to work. So process number two. So here's what happens. So kernel one, or process number one, is, is going to be uh, swi switched out. And so we got to save it's everything. It's context, in other words. So the program counter, all the general purpose registers, all other registers, special purpose ones, and floating point ones, as we'll be talking about soon. So all that's going to be saved, and it's saved in, in kernel memory. And so, now going the other way, restore. we're going to restore process number two's register. So everything. Program counter, general purpose registers, and everything else. So back from memory into the actual registers. And the other thing that needs to be done is to take care of, of address translations. So process number two will have a completely different set of address translations. And there are a couple of ways to do this, as we'll see uh, in a moment. And, and finally, once all that's set up, we're ready to resume execution of process number two. And so it will take off from, from the value in the program counter that was last saved. So that was the point at which it was last interrupted. Now, a little bit more about the second last point there on 
on ensuring address translation works uh, and it's set up for process number two. Okay, so as we mentioned, there's a couple ways. So let's look at a simple way first. So the idea here is simply let's let's zero out or um, invalidate all, all the TLB entries. Okay, those were for process number one and they won't work at all for process number two, even though we, they may use some of the same tags. So the mapping will be totally different. So when process number two is, is restarted now, so um, initially, you know, after we, we invalidate everything, we'll initially have lots of TLB misses, but um, we'll also, you know, start building up translations from, from the processes page table as we go. Okay, so this, this is an appropriate, uh, uh, an appropriate method, by no means the best way to do it, but it's an appropriate method for a very simple TLB example. So, for example, on the handout on TLB organization, and once again, we urge you to take a close look at that. Here's a basic TLB. Now, notice that we've added a few more status bits here. So, the dirty reference and write access bits. So, dirty means much the same thing as it does in a cache. It's been written into. Reference means it's been used recently. And write access means we can write into it, say, with a stored word instruction. Otherwise, it's just the basic translations, tag and physical process, pa physical page number. And so there's, there's no association whatsoever with, with process, with the process involved here. So here's a better way to do it. And so now we do associate it with, with a pro, uh, translations with processes. And we use something called an address space ID number. So here's how it's set up. So an ASID. So let's look at an improved cache or TLB now. Okay, with the same status bits, but now we got one extra field here called address space ID. So again, this is the second TLB on example on the handout. <coughs> and so here is the uh, address ID for, say, process number two. So every process has their own unique ID number. Okay, so that changes our hit and miss strategy a little bit. So now we have a hit when the usual tag matches and it has to be valid, but now we also match the address space ID for that, for that translation. So if, if all three of those now match, we have a hit. Otherwise, it's a miss. So the nice thing about this, this latter approach is that uh, address translations for multiple processes can coexist in the TLB. So it is not necessary to, to invalidate everything before re restarting a process. Now, let's, let's uh, finally, let's talk about uh, page faults, a little more detail about that and replacement strategies. So once again, a reminder that a page fault is, is when uh, a page is needed. It's not in memory, it's on the disk. So we need to go out to the disk and go get it. And so we need to find a place in memory to put it. So let's look at a couple of situations here. So first, let's say that there is room in memory. So uh, we've got uh, pages not being used. So that's the easy situation. The kernel operating system kernel then picks an available page in physical memory and, and loads the, that page in, into memory from the disk. Okay, now the other situation is if we're full or nearly full and there may be no free pages available in memory, then something's got to go. And so the operating system then decides, so of, from those pages in use, so it could be in use by, by this or some other process, and we'll call that a victim. And some least recently used strategy is, is typically used. And that's what the reference bit for is in, in the TLBs that we drew above. So a clean victim, and again, this is indicated by the dirty bit, means that we don't have to save this thing back to the disk. We can simply write over it. So read the page from disk and just write over that existing memory. 
Meanwhile, if that page in memory is dirty, meaning it's been written into, it will have to be saved to the disk in case it's needed later. So then, then we can read the page we're after in from the disk and over top of this in memory. So in our next video lecture, which will be a short one, it will be on a memory performance example.